then um, before we get started here and I hand this over to Dr. Lessam, I'm going to just remind everybody to that this um, seminar is going to be recorded today. And I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us. This is our first of several for um, spring 2021. Um, this, um, these will be about from 320 to 410 usually roughly unless it is a speaker that is in another country and then we'll be starting them at 3 p.m. So I'm gonna go ahead, thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Lessa. Yeah, welcome everyone. First of all, thanking, uh, I would like to thank you for, for joining. It is uh, uh, quite a lot of people are that signed up. I'm really impressed by the number of people coming. Um, a, a short reminder, we have this uh, great talk of Jonathan today. Next week, we will have another talk of uh, uh, Natalie Katsurnis um, from the University of Groningen. Uh, we will, or Ashley will send around uh, the flyer. We don't have a title yet, but I'm, um, she's doing a lot of great, uh, great research. So I'm pretty sure it will be very exciting, uh, exciting seminar. Uh, so again, thanks a lot for joining. Uh, when preparing this, this seminar, I thought, well, there are certainly better people qualified than me to introduce Jonathan. We all know Jonathan, right? But uh, there, there are definitely people that know him better than I do. So uh, I'm very happy that I got some support. Uh, and uh, there is uh, Lena and she, um, she volunteered to uh, say a few words and introduce uh, Jonathan before he can start with his presentation. Good, thank you. Thank you, Vern. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Well, it is my great pleasure today to introduce Professor Jonathan Salinger. Jonathan received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Harvard University. After a short time in Caltech and UCLA, Jonathan joined Naval Research Laboratory, where I believe he worked on different projects related to his material science interest from 1992 until 2005. In 2005, we were very lucky to have Jonathan join AMLCI and CPAP, which I was taught that now called Material Science Graduate Program as an Ohio eminent scholar. In addition to many other honors, Jonathan has been named as a fellow of American Physical Society, as well as a fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science. You can read all those facts and see many more of his distinguished awards in his CV by yourself. I really wanted to share something that is not in his CV today. And I would like to add this one more thing that I believe Jonathan also has a great talent for capturing behavior of very complex physical systems in concise, simple, and easy to understand models. And using basic theoretical concepts, Jonathan captures the full complexity of those systems. And I think Jonathan's talents extends into presenting his research in very easy to understand intuitive ways to both experts and non-experts in the field. So without further ado, please enjoy Jonathan's talk today on defects in liquid crystals, topology, geometry, and mechanics. Well, thank you so much, Leanna. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Okay, let me uh, bring up the talk here. It is just uh, great to see so many people here from uh, so many places, from uh, Illinois, I saw from Brazil, from New Mexico, the land of enchantment. That is just uh, fantastic. So um, what I want to do in, in this talk is to tell you um, a, a little bit about um, different perspectives on uh, looking at uh, defects in liquid crystals. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel a, a little bit uh, funny about um, speaking uh, on this topic in the virtual LCI when there are, uh, of course, so many here uh, who are such experts in the, in the field of uh, defects and topology in, in, in liquid crystals. Um, but maybe I can just, um, you know, add in my own perspective and see uh, if anybody, you know, can, can uh, complement that. 
Um, okay, so this is uh, work now uh, with uh, collaborators, uh, with Robin, with my former student, uh, Xing Zhou Tang, and my current student, um, Cheng Wang. Uh, all right, so um, how do I get started here? A lot of this work in the area of um, defects in liquid crystals um, is motivated by recent research on uh, active pneumatic phases. So let me just take uh, a, a couple of minutes to, to give a quick uh, intro to this field of uh, active liquid crystals. Uh, so this is a field that um, comes out of, um, well, trying to make physical models of animal behavior. Uh, and so uh, we have lots of examples like flocks of birds or schools of fish uh, where um, animals have some short range interaction with their neighbors and they're all moving together and they start to form some ordered structures like this and not just static ordered structures but ordered structures that are actually moving, continue moving. Um, similar things are seen with uh, swarms of bacteria, growth of epithelial tissue, uh, self-propelled colloidal particles. All right, so um, uh, here in LCI, um, Oleg's lab is, is doing quite a lot in this, in this area. Um, so uh, one thing to, to point out here is that these uh, active materials uh, often have a uh, pneumatic uh, liquid crystalline order. Um, here is an example from um, experiments of uh, Zvonimir Dojic's uh, work uh, at, uh, at Brandeis and UCSB. Um, so this is a, a two-dimensional example uh, of uh, uh, an active pneumatic phase based on uh, microtubules. And what you can see here is that um, the material keeps moving. It has a tendency to extend along the local director. And um, that leads to the formation of, of defects. Um, you can see the formation here is a minus half disclination. Here is a plus half disclination. These disclinations keep on moving. They keep forming and annihilating each other. And um, similar things have now been uh, done in his lab for three-dimensional liquid crystals. And so, uh, whoops, how do I get this movie to go? Um, in three-dimensional liquid crystals, yeah, it's not playing the movie, come on. Well, forget the movie. In three-dimensional liquid crystals, they see similar kinds of things with disclination lines. Um, that is, the, the lines are constantly in motion. The lines are moving around, forming, reforming all the time. Um, and so that has led to quite a lot of recent interest in the prop, oh, there it goes. In, in the properties of uh, disclinations in, in liquid crystals. Um, and so, let's see, now that I started the movie, can I stop the movie? Come on, there it goes. So, you know, I mean, there's, uh, for, for, for those of us in the field of, of, um, of uh, conventional liquid crystals, right, we've been concerned about topological defects for a long time. But with the advent of, of uh, research on active liquid crystals, there's really been a renaissance of interest in disclinations um, because they are so common and they are such a prominent feature uh, of, the, of the properties of, uh, of active pneumatics. And so um, th that's what I want to discuss here. And um, I want to convince you of the idea that um, there's, there's more to, to to topological defects than just topology, right? that there's this whole range of uh, properties to study, uh, including geometry, including uh, energy and forces, uh, and uh, leading into dynamics. Okay. So I'm going to begin in um, two dimensions. And so the first uh, half of this presentation will be in two dimensions and then go on to 3D. So in two dimensions, um, we, we know that um, disclinations can have uh, structures like this. 
Okay? And uh, a typical way to characterize the structure is by uh, drawing a Berger's circuit like this uh, about the center of a disclination and then seeing uh, how many times the director rotates as we move around this loop. Okay? So here in this example, as we move around the loop, the director uh, rotates through a full circle. Uh, in this example, as we move around the loop, the director rotates through a half circle. And so based on that, uh, people define a topological charge to be one over two pi times this uh, integrated angle through which the director rotates. Okay? And in a two-dimensional pneumatic phase, the possible topological charges would be any integer or half integer. So plus or minus half, plus or minus one, et cetera. Okay, now here's the thing about this description. This topological charge is a scalar quantity, but the, the defects don't look like scalars. They, they look like objects that have some kind of an orientation, right? So um, here are some examples of that. Right here is, for example, um, a minus one defect. It looks like some fourfold symmetric object. It's pointing in four directions. Right, the minus half defect looks like it's a triad pointing in three directions. The plus half, as if it's pointing in one direction. The plus one is a special case that looks kind of like a scalar, but nothing else looks like a scalar. And of course, you know, we in liquid crystal science, you know, ought to be the most sensitive of anyone to the orientation of objects. And so uh, you might ask, is there anything to say about the orientation of defects um, apart from the scalar property of the topological charge? Now, as far as I know, this kind of a question was uh, first addressed by uh, Luca Giomi and his student uh, Romans. Um, and they worked on a, a vector formalism to describe which way a defect is pointing. Um, this is a concept which works great for a plus half defect. It absolutely seems reasonable to characterize this sort of object uh, by uh, a, a single vectorial orientation. Um, it's a little bit more confusing when you apply it to a minus half disclination uh, to define a, a vector to characterize that. So that's something that um, I started working on with my uh, student, uh, Shing Zhe Tang. Um, and the, the way we looked at it was to say, you know, if you have a, a director in 2D characterized by some uh, angle theta, we might say that the, the defect of topological charge K at the origin has um, this kind of um, director uh, orientation as a function of position uh, everywhere in the plane. And then we can ask, uh, where does the director point radially outward or inward, right? That there are four uh, special directions where the director is pointing radially and we can solve for those, right? So we can say, what are those angles um, in terms of the theta naught in this equation. And it's something which is defined um, modulo this quantity, right? So modulo pi over absolute value of a minus defect charge. Okay? So then we could say, we can define a vector um, modulo pi over two in, in this case. Right, so for a defect with a topological charge of one half, the angle is defined modulo two pi, okay? So that means like any other angle, it's a uniquely defined orientation in the plane that makes a single valued defect vector. Um, that's the same kind of vector that Romans and Geomi were talking about. And so uh, we can determine that a vector P from the director field um, by taking the divergence of uh, NN uh, or vice versa. We could determine the director field from P uh, and we get this kind of a profile, at least in the case of a single uh, Frank elastic constant. Um, 
So that's for a plus half. What about for a minus half? Um, for a minus half, the analogous thing makes a, uh, an angle defined modulo 2 pi over 3. So defined modulo 120 degrees. Okay? So that means that there's a defect vector p, which is triple valued. Right? It's pointing in um, three directions at once. That's OK if you don't mind having vectors that are triple valued. Um, if that bothers you, um, a good alternative to that is to make a tensor to characterize the, the orientation of this object. Okay, we can define a tensor of rank three uh, through this kind of a construction. Okay, so a fully symmetric tensor of rank three. And it is a single valued object which characterizes which way the director is, uh, which way the defect, excuse me, is pointing. And then we can determine either the director field from the T tensor, it looks like this, or we can determine the T tensor from gradients of the director field like that. And this sort of construction um, works for any topological charge, okay? So we could say, that um, the, the orientation for a defect of topological charge K uh, can be def described by a tensor uh, with this rank, two times the absolute value of one minus K. Okay? And so we would then say, uh, all right, for each type of defect, there's a type of tensor that we can use to show how that sort of object is oriented. The special case in all of this is a defect of charge plus one. Plus one is really different from everything else. That's because it can be described then by a tensor of rank uh, zero, right? K, K equals one makes this thing to be zero. So a scalar, right? That um, in a defect of uh, plus one, a topological charge plus one, the parameter theta naught, the extra additive constant in the, the theta field um, doesn't represent an orientation. Instead, it describes the splay or bend character of the defect. So some scalar property associated with the defect. Um, okay, so, so that's a little bit of geometry and using tensors to describe geometry. But now one might ask, you know, does it matter for physics, right? Is there anything that's affected by the defect orientation? Um, sometimes yes, okay? So um, one place where it could well matter is in the interaction of defects. So there's a classical calculation to calculate the um, energy of interaction, free energy of interaction of uh, two defects at different positions in the plane, okay? And the way that works is you specify the topological charges and the positions of the two defects, and then you can calculate the director field everywhere in the whole plane around the defects, and then integrate the Frank free energy over the whole plane. And then we say, well, how does that integrated energy depend on the distance between the defects, right? So we take the integrated Frank energy and associate it with the two defects and see then what's the distance dependence that gives an effective force between the defects. It turns out to be analogous to uh, Coulomb's law in, in two dimensions. So it gives a Coulomb-like uh, uh, attraction between opposite charges or repulsion between like charges, okay? But that's if we specify the charges and the positions of the two defects. You might ask, well, what if we want to specify more than that? What if we want to specify the charges and the positions and the orientations of the two defects? So that maybe we'll hold one fixed and rotate the orientation of the other one. Okay. So that's um, a calculation that uh, we've done. Um, 
for the case of a single frank elastic constant um, using the method of conformal mapping. Okay, so conformal mapping is an analytic method uh, to solve uh, Laplace's equation. Um, in this case, uh, it is uh, solving Laplace's equation um, for the director field in the two-dimensional plane everywhere outside of the defect cores. Okay, so here's a core around one defect. Here's a core around another defect. And so we're going to specify where the defects are located and also specify what's the orientation right on the boundary of this core. Okay. So um, we, we can do that. Okay. And so there is a, a, a solution of that problem, which gives theta as a function of position everywhere in the plane. And it works in a picture like this, which is probably familiar to most of you. This is a picture which shows the optimum relative orientation of the two defects. But it also works if the relative orientation is something that's not optimum, right? So here's an example where the defect on the right has been rotated by 90 degrees compared to its optimum orientation over there. Okay. And so it makes a different director field. This director field has more frank free energy. Here it's been rotated through another 90 degrees, and it makes an even more wound up director field. So even more frank free energy, and so forth. Okay. And then we can put this uh, solution for the director field um, into the frank free energy integrate over the half plane and um, see what we get, okay? And um, with a few approximations, we, we get uh, an expression like, like this one. And so the, the first two terms here are familiar, okay? So the first term is the self-energy that's associated with the total topological charge of K1 plus K2. The second term is a uh, Coulomb-like uh, interaction. That's the, the classical calculation of the interaction free energy. And then there's this other thing which makes an orientationally aligning interaction. So here, delta theta is the uh, orientation, the relative orientation compared with the optimum relative orientation. And so this kind of a term tends to push the um, relative orientation towards the, the, the best case, right? Which is the best case is what you would get if you didn't specify the relative orientation, but you just let the defects pick out whatever orientation they want. This kind of relative energy can be important for dynamics, okay? So suppose we want to do defect dynamics, okay? Um, in that case, the, the kind of equation that we want to solve would be something like this, okay? And so it's like saying that there's some sum of forces which is equal to zero to describe overdamped motion, okay? So one of the forces is the interaction force that comes from a derivative of the free energy. Uh, another force is the, the drag force coming from a derivative of the Rayleigh dissipation function. Um, in an active liquid crystal, the active force could also come from a derivative of that dissipation function. Um, we might also have some constraints, like a constraint of incompressibility, which goes into this equation. Okay, so there's a long process to um, set up these equations of motion um, and by you know, expressing this in more detail in terms of the director field, the fluid flow field, or perhaps in terms of the pneumatic order tensor and the fluid flow field, or perhaps in terms of the defect position and orientation and the, uh, yeah, and the defect position and orientation. So we can set up these kinds of equations of motion um, on different levels, on more microscopic levels or building up to more macroscopic levels. So for people who get excited about different types of mathematical formalism, 
there's a lot to get excited about here. Maybe not everyone in the world gets excited about that sort of thing. So in case you don't, I'll skip ahead to some results. Um, so um, here uh, are a couple of movies of defect annihilation in conventional pneumatic liquid crystals. Okay. So on the left, we have um, a case with two defects that start off with the optimal relative orientation. You see this starting point looks like they're ready to fit in with each other, okay? And then it looks like the interaction between the defects is a central force interaction. It pulls the defects straight together. Okay? By comparison, on the right is an example of um, a two defects that start off at some non-optimal relative orientation. Right? They start off with one of these solutions where we've intentionally messed up the relative orientation. And in that case, the interaction between the defects is not a central force interaction. And so it leaves, leads to some curved trajectories that um, uh, can be seen here as the defects move together. So you know, there, there are curved trajectories that are seen in experiments on, on defect annihilation. So something like this could, uh, could well be involved there. Um, so these are experiments, excuse me, these are simulations done by my uh, former student, Shinzo Tang. Um, here's another uh, example uh, he would want me to show in an active pneumatic liquid crystal. Um, what you can see here is the uh, director field on the top and the velocity field on the bottom. Um, and the important thing to notice there is that this property of defect orientation is even more important in active liquid crystals than it is in conventional liquid crystals. In conventional liquid crystals, it is sometimes important because if the relative orientation of the defects is not the optimal one, then it changes around the result. Okay? But in active liquid crystals, this defect orientation is always of paramount importance because it indicates you know, which direction these plus half defects will move as they spontaneously self-propel. And this is indeed seen in many, many experiments in Oleg's lab and, and elsewhere. Uh, okay, this is one example in an active liquid crystal. Um, here is um, another example. Can I make it go? Come on, come on. Okay, here's another example where the defect pushes up against a wall. And when it hits the wall, it doesn't know which way to go. And then, but eventually, if it pushes hard enough, it spontaneously breaks the symmetry and says, oh, I'll go this way, Meh. the boundary, and goes, goes back and forth that way. So that would be a defect pushing up against a wall that can break symmetry if it pushes hard enough. All right. That was my story in two dimensions. Okay, that was so much fun in two dimensions. Let's do it again in three dimensions. Okay, what can we say about defects in three dimensions? Okay, well, we know that um, any picture in two dimensions can just be extended uniformly into the third dimension. Okay, so if we have a picture like this one on the top, for example, um, which shows a defect of topological charge a half, um, we would naively expect that it can just be extended to make a defect line of charge plus half extending directly out of the screen. And then we would say, oh, for a defect of minus a half, we'll just extend that to make a, a line of charge minus a half. Actually, that naive thing is not quite right. Um, it, the story in three dimensions is actually considerably more complicated than the story in two dimensions. And that is because um, 
with the possibility of rotating the director field in 3D, you can continuously transform any half charge defect into any other half charge defect. Um, let's watch a movie of that maybe. Haha, <laughs> here it goes. Okay, so here you could see a defect that used to be a charge half and then it rotated and it made a charge minus half. And then it rotated again and made a charge half again. Okay, and then any integer charge defect can be continuously transformed into no defect at all through escape into the third dimension, which looks kind of like this. If I can make it go, here it goes. Ah, it escaped. Nope, now it's back in the plane and it's minus one. Now it escaped. Now it's back in the plane and it's plus one. Okay, so um, the, the point of this is that from the point of, from the perspective of topology, there's only one type of defect line in three dimensions, right? All you can say is that there is a half charge defect line in three dimensions. And you can't say, is it plus half, is it minus half? Um, and there is no integer charge, right? That this kind of defect line is the only topological kind of defect line. But as I was showing you in two dimensions, topology isn't everything. So, you know, there really are geometric differences between these different kinds of structures that I was just uh, looping through. So, you know, what can we say about them using the same spirit as what we were saying about the geometry in two dimensions? And in particular, um, we know with the plus half that there should be uh, a vector to characterize it. But we can see the same object, whoops, we can see, come back, we can see the same object transforming itself into a minus half. Well, you saw it already. Uh, and then it's characterized by a rank three tensor. So what's the deal about a vector transforming into a rank three tensor? Okay, so that's the geometry that we wanna do here. This job was partially done by Friedel and Degen back many, many years ago. When they were working in 1969, okay, they were looking at um, the geometry of defect lines and they characterized the structure by two vectors. Okay, so one vector is the tangent vector along the defect line, that's this T. Okay? And then another vector is what vector does the director rotate around as we go in a loop about the core? Okay, we could say as we go around this loop, you know, the right hand rule defines some orientation that you're rotating around, okay? So in this, and, and that's called uh, omega, okay? So in this picture, omega and T, these are two parallel unit vectors, but if we modify the defect structure, we could have omega rotate with respect to T, okay? So there's some characteristic angle that says what's the relative orientation. And so if omega is parallel to T, we get something that looks like a plus half disclination in the plane. That's what um, those guys called a, uh, a wedge disclination. Can I make this thing play again? No, I can't. Well, that's what you're looking at. Uh, that's, that's a wedge disclination, okay. Um, if we make the omega vector be anti-parallel to T, um, then the whole structure looks like a minus half. Okay, it's a minus half wedge disconnection. Uh, if we make these vectors um, perpendicular, then um, we get some three dimensional structure. The director is not in the plane, the director is rotating in all three dimensions um, as we go uh, about the, the disconnection core. You might call that a twisted disconnection. Okay, so this is something that Friedel and Degen did um, decades ago, um, but it is um, not 
the complete story because you know it describes whether something looks like a plus half or a minus half disclination or something in between, but it doesn't describe um, what is the orientation of the two-dimensional object in the two-dimensional plane, like we were talking about in the first half of the seminar. Okay, so we need to add something else. Okay. So that's uh, a, a further uh, geometric uh, construction that uh, we've worked on. Um, and, um, well, you know, I'm going to skip over the math here and I'll move to some pictures. Okay, here are some nice pictures of the sort of geometric construction that we can do. So these are um, pictures um, that um, represent uh, a simulation of uh, a pneumatic, a 3D pneumatic liquid crystal uh, with a pattern substrate. Okay, so here's a pattern substrate that has a plus half disclination over here and a minus half disclination over here. Okay, so the director field in the substrate is fixed. But then the director field in three dimensions can um, change, it can adapt to the two dimensional boundary condition. In this case, it adapts by making a disclination line, an arch which goes upward from uh, this uh, plus half and goes around and then downward and hits the minus half. Okay. Um, so there's a director field everywhere in 3D, but I'm not drawing it just to make something easier to look at. I'm only drawing the director field just close by the discrimination line. And so you can see it is a twisted director field uh, around the discrimination line. And so we can characterize that by a bunch of different vectors, okay? So we can, of course, have a tangent vector everywhere going along this line. We can say, what's the omega vector everywhere along this line? That omega vector is pointing upwards everywhere. We can also have um, a pancake uh, perpendicular to the omega vector. Um, which indicates um, what's the pneumatic Q tensor right in the middle of the disclination core. That Q tensor in the middle of the core is some um, negative pneumatic order, which can be characterized by an oblate ellipsoid or pancake like this. Okay, and then what? If we look at derivatives of the director field, or we look at derivatives of the Q tensor field, either one, um, all around the disclination, we can break that up in, um, into a, a sum of a vector part, a rank two tensor part, and a rank three tensor part, right? That is the whole tensor of all possible derivatives of the Q tensor. Um, decomposes into things of one-fold and two-fold and three-fold rotational symmetry based on what happens if you rotate about the omega vector. The vector part is this vector P, just like I told you about for a 2D plus half defect. Right? So that is biggest when the structure looks like a 2D plus half defect. It is smallest when the structure looks like a 2D minus half defect. So this P vector sort of fades out as you go along the line. By comparison, there is a threefold symmetric part, which um, is equivalent to the rank three tensor that I used to describe a minus half disclination in the plane. And that um, threefold tensor sort of fades in as you go from one end of the loop uh, of the arch to the other end, as you go from the plus half around to the minus half part. So it's not that the vector transforms into the rank three tensor, but uh, the vector fades out and the rank three tensor fades in. And then there is yet a third piece that is a rank two tensor, 
which is associated with the three-dimensional twisted aspect of the disclination structure. And that is maximum right in the middle. And it's zero for the two uh, two-dimensional cases. So it fades in and then it fades out again. Okay. Uh, this is one example. Just to show you another brief example, um, here is a substrate that is patterned with two plus half disclinations. And then um, we do a simulation of what's the 3D director field uh, in the middle of the cell. And under some circumstances, if we make homeotropic alignment on a substrate on the top somewhere, um, we can get a line that connects this plus half to this plus half. And it's a line that has this funny structure where it starts looking like a plus half. And then it's, it makes a twisted disclination, and then it makes a minus half, and then it makes a twisted disclination again, and then it makes a plus half again. And uh, we can characterize that by the um, uh, omega vector, the uh, vector constructed by uh, Dijen and Friedel, um, which rotates around like this, or we can characterize it by the, the P vector, the two tensors I was talking about. The P vector fades out and then it fades in again in the other direction. The rank two tensor is maximal here in the twisted places. And the rank three tensor is maximal right in the middle where it identifies the three characteristic orientations associated with the minus half structure. Okay, that's geometry. What does it mean for physics? Okay. Um, what can we say about the forces that are pushing disclinations around? Okay. Well, um, this is an area where we um, rely on some analogies with dislocations in crystalline solids, which is an area where uh, Robin is really an expert and she's been uh, pointing out some, some uh, related work. Okay, so one important thing that she pointed out uh, is the, the peach Kaler force. Okay, so in crystalline solids, um, people know that um, whenever you have a dislocation with a certain Burgers vector and a certain tangent vector, and you put the crystal under an external stress, sigma, then the dislocation experiences some force per unit length which is constructed in this way. And this is actually a really important part of the um, material science of solid materials. Uh, it, it determines what happens to dis, uh, dislocations in a crystal when you pound on the crystal. Okay, now this was actually applied to disclinations in pneumatic liquid crystals uh, by Kleiman uh, in his book about uh, points, lines, and walls. Um, the history of this is a little bit confusing to me. Clément wrote about it, but then it seems to have been hardly ever mentioned in liquid crystal research in the last 40 years. I don't really understand that. Um, anyhow, um, the, the point is that there is a similar sort of effect in, um, in pneumatic liquid crystals um, that combines the, um, the omega vector associated with the disclination and a kind of effective stress tensor that comes if you try to rotate the top of a cell with respect to the bottom. Okay, so here are a few examples. Let's concentrate on this picture in the upper right. Okay, so here in this picture, we see that uh, I have a cross section of a disclination line. Okay, so here's the tangent vector coming through this way, and the director field around the tangent vector is rotating through 180 degrees. Okay. And now um, we put a torque on the top in comparison with the bottom. Okay, so this is like a jar opening torque, right? It's like I grab the top and the bottom of a jar and I'm trying to open it. <laughs> as hard as I can, right? And so uh, that's that's this torque, right? The opposite torques on the top and the bottom, okay? And so um, that torque makes a force 
which pushes the disclination sideways like this. That's the liquid crystal version of the peach caver force. Um, that um, might be clear because you could say, if you twist the top with respect to the bottom, then uh, this side of the disclination has not such a big difference between the orientations of the top and the bottom. And this side has a bigger difference in the orientations between the top and the bottom. And so uh, the disclination moves to make more of the low energy region and less of the high energy region. That's the analog of the peach scalar force. This happens in the lab. In fact, it happens in Hiroshi Yukiyama's lab. Um, so uh, here is an experiment uh, from the dissertation of uh, Joe Angelo uh, a few years ago, uh, working in the Yokoyama lab. Right? And so uh, in this experiment, they have a pot pattern substrate on the bottom. Um, there is a disclination represented by the orange line that you can just barely see going across here. Um, and uh, when the top is initially oriented this way, the line is right here. And then when they rotate the top, the orange line gets pushed down a little bit. When they rotate the top more, the orange line gets pushed down more. And then when they rotate the top enough, the orange line moves a lot like this. And it keeps moving around more and more. And then it kind of curves in this fun, funny way so that it almost touches itself. And then it does touch itself and it reconnects so that you get a big uh, uh, loop like this. And then you're back to having a little loop, a little disclination between the two uh, endpoints. Um, here's the uh, micrograph, right? So here you can see that uh, rotating the top with this uh, jar opening kind of stress um, pushes the disclination first a little bit and then uh, a lot like this so that it um, touches itself and reconnects. Um, and um, this is analogous to the behavior called the Frank Reed source for dislocations in crystal and solids, which is an important mechanism in material science for getting a lot of dislocations. Um, what else can we do with this, right? Well, um, in the area of crystal and solids, you know, another thing that people do with the peach Kaler force is that they use it as a, a trick to calculate the interaction uh, between two dislocations. That is, they can calculate the force of one dis dislocation on another dislocation. Um, we can do the analogous procedure for disclinations in uh, pneumatic liquid crystals. Okay? We can do that by calculating the stress field from disclination number one. And then um, we say, what's the stress field uh, from disclination one at a certain position on disclination two? and then integrate all along disclination two to say, what's the total peach Kaler force uh, acting on disclination two? And um, this can be done exactly in the case of equal Frank constant. And um, it makes uh, these results for the interaction between um, disclinations uh, somewhat different for the cases where the disclinations are, are parallel or not parallel to each other. But in either case, the, the interaction could be uh, an attractive or a repulsive force, depending on the product of these two dot products, the product of the, the dot product of the omegas and the dot product of the t's. Right? So that tells us something about how disclinations um, interact with each other. One funny thing about this is that it de depends on the omega vectors. It doesn't depend on the other vectors and tensors that I worked so hard to define in the geometry. Okay, why not? Well, um, I think what's happening here is that 
um, this peach Kaler calculation is automatically assuming the optimum relative orientation. So it's like the, uh, the Coulomb's law style calculation in two dimensions, which automatically assumes the optimum defect orientation. Um, I uh, have not yet found a way to put the non-optimal defect orientation into this calculation. One last thing to show you um, briefly uh, concerning dynamics, okay? So, so there are um, ways we can solve the dynamic equation in three dimensions. Um, that is to solve schematically this combination of forces, right? To say that the interaction force plus the drag force plus the active force plus the constraint force all has to sum up to zero. Okay, um, and um, this has been done by other investigators. For example, we heard from Julia Yeomans uh, last semester in this um, LCI seminar series. Um, so uh, that kind of thing, um, you know, we can address it with the different vectors that we construct here. In particular, we can um, figure out that the active force is in the direction P. This is indeed using the P vector that we've defined through this geometrical construction. Uh, by comparison, the um, constraint force is in a more complicated direction. That involves the tangent vector. It involves lots of stuff. Okay, And so it gives a direction of the active velocity in a more complex direction. And this kind of thing has been done um, by uh, the group of uh, Gareth Alexander, for example, uh, just in, in, a, in a PRL last year. Um, so the, the geometrical construction serves in some way to interpret that calculation, to say there's a force in a direction that we can easily characterize by P, but the constraint is in a more complicated direction. And so that makes velocity that you know, corresponds to what um, those guys calculate. Okay, I'm um, running out of time here. So let me just wrap up with the main conclusions of this study um, that topological defects are uh, an important phenomenon in uh, conventional liquid crystals and they're especially important and especially common in active liquid crystals. And then that there's, there's a lot more to topological defects than topology, right? That we need this full combination of topology, uh, geometry, um, energy and forces uh, and dynamics. Um, and then just to uh, acknowledge once again, my, my collaborators, uh, Robin Selinger, uh, uh, former student Shingzo Tang, who's now a postdoc with Juan de Pablo at the University of Chicago, uh, and my uh, current student, uh, Cheng Wong, uh, and with funding from uh, NSF. Uh, so I uh, thank all of them and thank all of you. Well, thanks a lot, Jonathan, for this uh, great and interesting talk. Um, and I'm pretty sure there are a few questions remarked from, from the audience. Yeah, may I ask a question? Oh, please. please. Oh. Um, uh, Jonathan, thank you. Wonderful presentation, nice results. Um, my question is about plus one defects in uh, 2D. Uh, don't you think that they are kind of under described by just a scalar plus one? Uh, for example, you might uh, produce chiral versions when splay and bend are mixed while um, the pure splay and pure band are uh, not chiral. So is there a possibility to introduce some distinctive uh, things, uh, maybe the spiral angle, and, um, and then see how it uh, affects interactions and things like that, maybe dynamics as well? For plus one. I would say they can be described by more than one scalar, but, but only by scalars. Right, that they, they don't have an orientation in the plane, but they can have more than one scalar property. 
Okay, so you know, one scalar property is just the single number plus one. Okay, but then um, another scalar property um, has to do with uh, what's the orientation of the director field around them with respect to the radial vector, say. And so, um, you know, you could say, what are the sines and cosines of, of that angle? Okay. And so that would make uh, uh, a property, a, a different scalar that characterizes the sort of thing that you're looking for. Uh, or a pseudo scalar to characterize the, the, the chiral aspect of that. Um, so that you know, under a reflection, it would transform to the, the negative of itself. So um, yeah, I, I think you're, you're right that the, the number plus one is not enough, but that the extra that's needed is, is scalar rather than vector or tensor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more, any other questions? Maybe from the students as well. Maybe the alumni just want to have a reunion here. Maybe, maybe oh. they chat it all the time in the back. I do have a question. Please. So I, it's probably silly, but uh, on the slide where you have a 2D fact annihilations in 2D, we're all used to the orientation of the well, the ones that was on the left, I guess the classical orientation of 2D facts when they just come together. I, I don't know if you want to try to skip to that slide or not. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Let me go back to that. I can for sure do I that. I don't know how easy it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, um, this slide, yes. Uh -huh. Please go ahead. Now we're still seeing you instead of the slide. Oh, you are? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> you have to start um, okay, again. let's try again. There's still a few bugs in the system. Here we are. Yeah, perfect. So my assumption on the left is that that's probably um, energetically the best configurations for two half defects to be in and they just annihilate along that straight line. What I found interesting is that on the right, the D, two D, each of the defects rotates slightly and then they annihilate, but they're not annihilating on the same line as the defects on the left. So they're not going, I guess, the direction of annihilation is not perpendicular to the pneumatic orientation. Do you, is that more preferred way? Do, do you understand why there's a difference? Since defects already rotated, you would think that they will rotate in the best orientation. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, maybe I, I really want to pause this movie, but now I'm just I'm going out of the show. Let me, let me see if I can do it in the non slideshow mode. Okay. If I share it like this. Okay. So you see it now, right? So can I put pause? Okay. You see the paused picture, right? Okay, good. Um, what I would say is, um, you know, the, in the in the early stages in the simulation on the right, um, the defects were um, both translating and rotating, right? and so uh, those two things uh, happened together, and then. Um, by the time the defects reach this state, um, they have achieved the optimum relative orientation, right? That this picture is the optimum relative orientation uh, for these two positions. And I guess you could, you could say that by saying that the, the director is roughly constant all along the line connecting the defects which is true also uh, in this case, right? That there's not extra unnecessary director rotation. Okay? And so uh, I would say, you know, in the beginning, they, they both translate and rotate, you know, in, in a way that um, rapidly gets rid of this, you know, excess rotation. And then the annihilation process proceeds 
pretty much straight, right? That, that after they get to that point, then they can go straight together. Um, and so, you know, the movie starting here up until the annihilation, that's like uh, the classical movie, right? That that is like mm -hmm. the movie over on the left side, um, except that, uh, you know, the whole picture has been turned on its side. So you have to look at it like this. That makes sense. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a, qu a question? Uh, uh, I like the talk. Uh, you s talk with simple words, but it's a lot beneath them. Okay. Uh, so my question, is, actually, it's two questions. Um, one question, when you have, uh, for example, plus one half, you have this uh, face phi naught in one half, which shows the orientation of a radial director. Is this, what is the difference for phi naught for uh, plus one half and plus one? This is the first question and, okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, for anything other than plus one, you know, if you if you add this this theta naught, that gives you a rotated version of the same structure. Yeah. With plus one and uniquely plus one, um, it doesn't give you a rotated version of the same structure. It gives you a different structure, um, and. Uh, but the the structure is is isotropic, right? And so that that is a special case. And so that is like making this extra scalar property that Oleg was asking about. Yeah. And second question: with this movie, uh, it looks like uh, you have this plus uh, uh, half and minus one half differ. It means uh, that outside of this area you should have a, a homogeneous director orientation. And it means that, uh, I don't know what, you, what kind of boundary conditions did you use, but in general, the orientation outside somehow also should affect uh, behavior of your defect. Um. Yeah. You have additional, uh, you have additional direct uh, vector which describe global symmetry of your system. Yeah, you 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 might say that as um, the the picture on the right, you know, was was started in an especially high energy state, right? That that to get a non-optimal relative orientation um, requires. A, a big distortion of the director fields all over the material. Um, and so the, the case on the right um, be, began in a high energy state. And so it's rapidly dissipating that energy as it goes into this uh, favorable relative orientation. Yes, but you see, if you look, for example, uh, on the left side, uh, left picture. Is this uh, internal structure is uh, optimal, but in general you can say, okay, what is the director outside of your picture? It looks like uh, the most favorable is uh, if uh, the director is horizontal outside uh, of this region, but I can imagine that it can be vertical or it has come some kind of any uh, angle uh, at the boundaries. And depending on this angle, it should be some kind of uh, additional uh, possibilities how it will move. Yes. I don't remember in this particular simulation what the boundary condition was. Um, okay. I think it was some kind of a, a free alignment. Um, 
the the issue that you're speaking about about the director field at infinity um that uh, was also addressed recently by the group of uh, Rolf Stenarius uh, experimentally. Um, he, he was also very much concerned about this question um, and had an article about that uh, maybe a year ago. Um, and um, so uh, he, he definitely found that um, fixing the orientation far from the annihilating defects um, creates uh, additional constraints. And that was um, you know, an issue for him on interpreting those, those experiments. And so, um, I don't know, I'm just pointing out uh, that, that's, that that is an important issue which, uh, which he considered and then um, Shingzo and I had a paper which was trying to analyze discrepancies between his experiments and our theory, which um, we attributed to the different Frank constants, although I'm not Thank sure you. he agrees. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thanks a lot. I think that the time is already advanced. So I would suggest if there's uh, if there are any more questions, maybe if you can stay online for a couple of minutes and ask them. Otherwise, I would suggest to um, to thank Jonathan again and to thank everyone uh, for joining us, Jonathan, for the great talk, and uh, thank you for joining us. I think it was a great seminar. Please don't forget seminar our next. Uh, next Wednesday, we have uh, another great speaker, um, uh, Natalie uh, Katsonis from University of Groningen. And Ashley, I think the time is a little earlier. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so it's not next. It's we do them every other Wednesday. So oh, it will be yes. uh, February tenth, I believe, and it will be yeah. at three p.m. And that I think is the only seminar as I know of this semester that will be at 3 p.m. But when I send out the flyers, I will make sure that it's um, a, you're aware when we do change the time. That everyone is aware. Well, then I would say thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, as I said, maybe if you want to stay and discuss further, I don't want you to stop that, otherwise, that is fine. I am not going anywhere. I haven't been anywhere in the last year. I'm not going anywhere in the next year of the year. So we all will be here in our bedrooms Skyping um, or uh, Zooming. So thanks a lot and uh, hopefully see you in two weeks.